Father, we praise you and thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity of gathering around your word. It is our continuing and sincere desire to know you more perfectly that we may serve you more faithfully. We thank you again and again that we can call you Abba Father and that you're not ashamed to call us and own us as your very own children, your very own redeemed and blood-washed family. We thank you for Jesus, our great Redeemer, our High Priest, and someday our coming King for all that he has done, for all that he is doing, and for all that he will do when he returns to receive us to himself. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you have sent into our midst to be our teacher and to be our guide. We know that without his anointing, we can do nothing as we ought to do it. Without his inspiration and revelation, we can know nothing as we ought to know it. But we do rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory that he is here and that he will guide us into the truth. I thank you that even now he is anointing every ear to hear and every heart to believe. And I thank you that my lips are now anointed to speak your word, that I will speak it accurately, and that revelation knowledge would flow freely in this service tonight, unhindered and unchecked by any force. And in obedience to your word, we covet earnestly the best gifts of the Spirit, that they would be in operation and in manifestation, that the needs of this assembled body may be met in a supernatural way. I personally thank you that your word declares that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Therefore, with great boldness and confidence, I look to the greater one who indwells me. And I know that he will think through my mind, he will speak through my lips, and he will minister to this vessel of clay to your people. And for all that shall be revealed and for all that shall be manifested, we promise and covenant with you now in advance before we ever begin that we will give you alone all of the praise, the glory, the honor, the adoration, and all of the thanksgiving, for we ask it in that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And all who agreed with that prayer said, Amen. Amen. Okay, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 18, and we will look again at our foundation scripture that our lesson series is based on. Proverbs chapter 18. <clears throat> Proverbs the 18th chapter, if you have it, say I have it. Verse 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit, death and life. That's it. What else is there? Death or life. But notice it says death and life. Both of them are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So it tells me then that words must be critical to our success in life. We can either speak death to our lives or we can speak life to our life. Notice what it does not say. It does not say death and life are in the power of Satan. It does not say that death and life is in the power of Almighty God. It doesn't say that death and life is in the power of the Holy Spirit. It says death and life is in the power of the tongue. So I believe we control whether we live or die. Now, some folk can't handle that. They, they say, oh, what, what, what do you mean? Are you saying you're usurping God's authority? Hey, friend, I didn't write this. Notice very carefully that in the 21st verse, Fred Price's name does not appear. This, I used to think this was God's word, that God ordained this book to be written. These are his words to us, not our words to him. He said death and life. I didn't say it. I'm simply reading it. God said death and life is in the power of the tongue. So I believe I can speak life to my life and I, or I can speak death to my life. And if you don't know that, you can speak death and not realize that you are speaking death, which opens the door and gives Satan a right to take you out big time and there's nothing God can do about it simply because he gave the authority to us. What I speak positively puts God to work in my circumstances. When I speak negatively, I put Satan to work 
in my circumstances. So we're talking about the power of positive confession. The power of positive confession. Since death and life are in the power of the tongue, and we just read it, <laughs> according to Proverbs 18.21, it is imperative that we guard our words and form the habit of always making positive confessions. Now, I gave you the other evening, and I want to revisit it, because the word confession immediately connotes a negative, usually. Because we usually think of confession as confessing something I've done wrong. And yet, in the New Covenant, the word confession comes from the Greek word, which literally means to agree with or say the same thing that God says. It means to agree with or say the same thing that God says. So if God says up, if I say up, I'm in agreement with God. If God says up and I say down, then I take myself out of God's hands and place myself on the turf of Satan, and he has the legitimate and legal right to take me out because I created the environment that gives him that right over my life, simply by words. And I pointed out, if you didn't think or don't think that words are important and that what we say is not important, I said it the other evening, I'll take you back to Genesis chapter 1, all through the first chapter, it says, and God said, and God said, it never says God thought. It said, and God said, God said, God said, and yet nothing came into being, into existence, until after God said it, not after God thought it, after he said it. I don't know why it works that way. But that's the way the Bible portrays it. That's the way God has designed the system. It's voice activated. A positive confession brings blessing, and a negative confession brings defeat. And the reason for this is found in Proverbs chapter 6. So go there, and then we'll move on. And it almost sounds like it's, you know, facetious to say it this way, but it's because we're so accustomed to talking negative. Okay, I'll give you an illustration. Ooh, I'm scared to death of cats. You've never heard an expression like that. Why aren't you scared to life? Why do you got to be scared to death? Why I want to die? It doesn't seem like it carries any weight if we don't have a negative attached to it. Huh? It's always something I'm scared to do. I, I, I'm sick as a dog. <laughs> Why can't you be well as a cat? <laughs> I got to be sick as a dog. I mean, it's, we always have this negative attached, and we, it's, it's such a habit that we never think about it when we come over into the realm of the things of God and we don't realize that we tie the noose of defeat around our own necks by our own tongues. By talking, well, I think I'm going to be sick. Why don't you say, I think I'm going to be well? Why you got to be sick? Well, it'll probably fail. Why can't it succeed? Why does it have to fail? I mean, it looks like we don't think that anything has any credibility unless we put a negative to it. Just a habit all the time. And it's interesting, you have to break yourself. It's a deliberate act on your part. You have to weigh every word. Because why? Death and life is in the power of the tongue, which means it's in the power of the words. So Proverbs chapter 6, if you have it, say, I have it. Verse 2, you're snared by, your, by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. That's awesome. Snare is a trap. You're snared. You're trapped by your words. And I used it before, and it, I mean, it sounds comical, but I don't say it to be funny. But every one of you that is married, you got into it by your big, fat mouth. <laughs> if you had not said, I do, you wouldn't have been married. If you had not said, I love you, I want to marry you, will you marry me? If you hadn't said that, you would be single, hung 
bite a tongue. <laughs> Sounds funny, and it, but if you think about it, go back and look over your life at many of the things that you're involved in. It, you got there by your words, by what you said. Amen. And don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> now, always keep in mind that what you confess is your faith speaking. Because faith is released by words through your mouth. Let me say that again. Faith is released by words through your mouth. Now, if you don't think that's true, let's go to Mark chapter 11 and see if I can substantiate that with Scripture. Mark chapter 11. It's a choice to speak death to your life or speak life to your life. You control it. I was so happy when I found out that principle because I always thought up to that time, the churches that I belonged to, because over a 17-year period, I uh, matriculated through four different denominations, only because I was trying to find a place I could fit in and work without a lot of politics and a whole lot of, you know, stuff. And because I wasn't brought up in the church from a child, when I saw something that wasn't right, I was out of there, boom. I wouldn't accept it just because, well, that's what we've always done. That's what we've always believed. Yeah, right. Talk to the hand. I'm out of here. And, and so when I found this out, that I had some control in terms of what I experienced in life, boy, I was a happy camper. A happy camper. And I mean, folks laughed at me and ridiculed me. But, you know, I didn't care. It didn't make me any difference. Because what you think about me is your problem. What I think about me, that's my problem. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 11, if you have it, say, I have it. Now, let me ask a question. Because what we're getting ready to read, we're getting ready to read something Jesus the Christ said. Do you, would you have any problem believing what Jesus said? Excuse me? Oh, so if Jesus said it, you can, you can deal with that. Okay? All right, now, watch your mouth. <laughs> okay. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Jesus says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now look at that verse carefully, because there is a mathematical equation that's revealed in the verse. Jesus said, watch me. Jesus said, whosoever shall say to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things he says will come to pass. He will have what he says, three to one. He only mentions believing one time. He mentions saying something three times. I wonder, is the man trying to tell us something? You didn't get that? Yeah, he says, whosoever shall say. Not whoever, whosoever shall think, whoever shall desire, whosoever shall want, whosoever shall say to the mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe where, obviously, even though it's not stated, it has to be in the heart, the same place where the doubt's not supposed to be. That's where the believing should be. Seems reasonable, right? So he says, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things he says will come to pass. He'll have what he says. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say you'd have what you believed. Well, I believe. That's where you start, no question about it. But he never said you'd have what you believe, because if you don't move from believing to saying, what you believe will never come to pass. Raise your right hands. Oh, okay, I just, I, I thought you left. <laughs> I wasn't sure, I just thought maybe you left. All right, that's so important. Whosoever shall say. I know when I first got a hold of this, I started saying things. Um, I was always, when I, when I came up, when I first, even when I first got saved for the first 17 years, I was, um, I, I was a world champion whiner. And I whine. 
I could whine in octaves. <laughs> I'm serious. It, it was pitiful. When I look back on it, I mean, it was really pitiful. But I didn't know anything else. I thought I was being honest by always confessing the circumstances. And my wife, my family can tell you, when I got a hold of this, that's why I don't have much patience with people when they tell me it's so hard to change. It's not how I change just like that. Overnight. Is that right? Overnight. Where I had been, oh, I can't make it. I, can't. I began to say, I believe I'm healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet in the name of Jesus. I believe I'm on top and not on the bottom. I'm the head and not the tail. All my needs are met. Didn't have a dime in the pocket. But I believe because the word said, my God shall supply all your needs. So I had to agree with God. So I said, I believe. So I didn't say all my needs were met. I said, I believe they are based on the word of God. That was my faith speaking. And I started speaking the word. They, folk laughed at me. But I didn't care because when I was saying all the negative stuff, they weren't doing anything for me. So why should I care now what they think? I'm only concerned about what he thinks and about what he thought at the time. So I began to confess it. And it started coming to pass, not instantaneously, because all the issues that I had, I didn't get them instantly. I've been working on them for years. But it's not going to take as long to get out as it did to get in if you start doing it God's way. So he said, whosoever shall say to the mountain, what, what mountain? You mean a Mount Everest? No. Mountain of debt, mountain of fear, mountain of can't do, mountain of whatever it might be that's a negative in your life. Speak to it. Start talking to it. God did. He said, light be and light was. The kids ought to act like the daddy, like the Abba Father. He spoke it into existence. Why don't you speak it into existence in your life? Find the scripture that promises it to you and begin to say what the word says rather than what the circumstances say. Okay? All right. Now, we talked already about several things. There are four things we must learn to confess if we want to compel Satan to back off and give us space. In other words, we have an enemy. His purpose is to take us out, okay, to, take, to wipe us out. Because to wipe us out, in his mind, is to wipe Jesus out. See, Jesus kicked his backside at Calvary and the resurrection. He wants, wants to get back at Jesus, but he can't get back at Jesus, but he tries to get back at the body of Jesus or the body of Christ, which is us. So he gets, he gets his kicks by taking us out. And many times we don't realize it and we play right into his hands by confessing everything that he sets in motion rather than confessing what the word of God says. And very, he's been very clever because he's a trickster, he, he's, a, he, he, he's a deceiver, and he's a liar. And what he's done cleverly, and many of you know this because all of you didn't come up in this type of a church. You didn't start out your Christian life in a church like this. You probably started out in some perhaps mainline denominational church. You didn't even take a Bible to church. What for? The preacher's not going to use it. <laughs> it's just extra baggage. I mean, you, what? So what he did cleverly is keep and kept the word of God out of the church to keep the people of God ignorant of their rights and continue to confess what the circumstances said. Even in, even in the music, you know, you know who Satan was before he screwed it up. He was choir master in heaven. He was a music man. And so he knows what music does to people. So he's got a lot of music in a lot of the churches. And people stand on their heads and wiggle their toes. and I mean, they just clap and sing. Nothing wrong with that per se. But they don't even listen sometimes to uh, what they're singing and what they're saying. I don't... Uh, in our, in our church, I, I sit on the regular seats like the rest of the people. I don't ever like sitting on the platform. You know why? I don't like it because of what you all been doing all night long after certain things I've said. You look over and see what the pastor thinks about it. <laughs> I see your eyes. I know. Hey, I know. I've been there and done that. And so when you're, when you're up there and standing up, then people are watching your reaction to the songs. And, of course, now these days we have these big screens. We can put the words up there. I don't sing any songs until after I've seen what the words say. I ain't going to get caught up. I've been there and done that, okay? Because so many songs are embalmed in unbelief. Got the beat, got the right words, 
got to say the words that rhyme with, you know, and, but they're unscriptural. You have to be careful. I'm very careful about what songs are sung in our church. Very, very careful. You, you, you just can't sing everything at Crenshaw Christian Center. It's got to promote the word, not just be melodious, not just be foot stomping, hand clapping. It's got to be the word. And we sing songs, not in this church, probably not, but in many, many of your mainline denominational churches. You have, in fact, you have a hymn book in the pew pocket with 5,000 songs in it. And most of the songs are embalmed in unbelief. We're not knocking the sincerity of the people who wrote it, but remember, people are many times a product of their upbringing, product of their denomination, product of their home, product of their schooling, and many times most people are not free thinkers. They don't do any thinking for themselves. It's called the herd mentality. Whichever way the crowd's going, that's the way they go. They don't think for themselves. So they just sing any, anything that sounds good. Some of the old hymns, you, you remember them. And, and that's why most Christians were, were bound, uh, and Satan just took advantage of them. Think about a song like, you ever heard this song, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while in others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, do not pass me by. Anybody ever heard that song? You ever sung that song? Terrible song. Why don't you just spit in Jesus' face and be done with it? They don't even realize what they're singing. Because when you say, do not pass me by, you have implied that he just might do so. And he said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. And you're talking about don't pass me by. Amen. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain. Anybody ever hear that song? Why in the world would you want to stay near the cross when the man that got crucified on it, once he got off, never went back. Why do you want to stay near it? You don't even think. You keep singing that, you have faith for a cross mentality. Kumbaya, kumbaya. Now, I hope I'm not shooting some song y'all sing. I don't know nothing about what y'all sing, so don't. Okay, now, just calm down. Calm, calm down now. Kumbaya. Kum, it was a beautiful song. Kumbaya, kumbaya. Come by here, Lord. Come by here. Somebody needs you, Lord. Come by here. It develops a kind of faith for a Lord that he's got to come by here. My Bible tells me he said himself, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Why are you saying come by here? He's already here because I'm here. You're here. He's here. He said he was. But you singing that song, you get a faith for a Christ that's out there somewhere. You got to come by here. And there are a lot of other modern songs. They just, boy, they, it's pitiful, pitiful. And people don't even, they just get all happy and get all glad and they get all emotional about it. And they don't realize what they're singing. But every time you say it, you hear it, and faith comes by hearing. And it can be negative faith. Just, just an example of how important it is what we hear. Now, we've already talked about what we are in Christ. We talked about where we are in Christ. Tonight, we want to talk about what we possess or what we have in Christ. We have to confess these things, say these things if we want them to come to pass. We have to agree with what God says about who we are, where we are, what we have, and what we can do. Everything the Word of God says we are, we are. Everywhere the Word of God says we are, we are. Everything the Word of God says we have, we have, and everything the Word of God says we can do, we can do. We may not be doing it, having it, or experiencing it right now, present tense, but the present tense is going to soon be the future tense. So if you start now in the present tense with the right format, the future will take care of itself. But if you don't start out right, you're in trouble. So we have to confess what the Word says about us, but so many Christians, they don't know what the Word says about them. They, they don't know what they have. You know, you have a covenant, new covenant. It promises you everything you'll ever need. I mean, Jesus paid his blood for it. And everything the covenant says you are, that's who you are. And 99% of Christians, they don't believe that. They don't even know it. You have Christians talking about, I know no one in here tonight is like this. But you have Christians, I, we run into them all the time, that have low self-esteem. Hmm. Inferiority complex. 
Mm. I mean, nobody in here, but, you know, we all have known people out there, you know, like that. How can you know what the Word says, what your, what your covenant says, and have low self-esteem? Okay. If you want to get ugly about it, let's go ahead. All right, we want to talk about what you have or what you possess in Christ. This has to do with your inheritance. Last night we talked about where you are in Christ. That had to do with your position in Christ. What's my position? Where I am. Where am I? Tonight we want to talk about our inheritance. We have an inheritance, and it's not in heaven. I mean, we, there's something in heaven, but that's not what the covenant's talking about. It's talking about now, the here and now. We're living in this life now. And Jesus said, I, I quoted it the other night, Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He never said, I came that you might go to heaven. He said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So if you're not living in abundance, then you're out of the will of God. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Not intentionally, but, you know, if you don't know something, it still works against you. You know, ignorance is no excuse. If you thought that was milk and you find out later after the autopsy is done that it was arsenic, you're still just as dead as you would be if you knew it. <laughs> you know, so ignorance, what's that got to do with anything? You better know. All right. Satan keeps most Christians in bondage to some degree at least because they do not know or claim what belongs to them as a result of their inheritance in Christ. Most Christians have the idea that you should never act like you have anything. You should always, it's always, if it be thy will. Lord, if it, if it be thy will. What do you think this is? This is a legal document ratified by the high court of heaven. The reason it's called testament is because testament means W-I-L-L, -L, will. Haven't you ever heard the statement, the last will and testament of so-and-so? That means that, that the person that wrote the will, this is what they want done with what belonged to them after their demise in reference to their successors, children, whatever. This is a will. It's a legal document. It tells you everything that belongs to you. But you have to sue for your rights, meaning you have to go, you have to, go to the reading of the will and say, hey, that's mine. That's me. He's talking about here's my ID. See? It's me. I'm telling you because Satan, like a lot of shyster lawyers, will cheat you out of your rights and spend all your money on their fees. And you end up with nothing. Amen. I didn't call any names, so drop your rocks. I don't know anybody in here that's a lawyer, so don't, get, don't make it personal. Okay? But, but you have a will, and it tells you everything that belongs to you. In fact, most Christians don't even know what the will is, the new covenant. They don't even know what the new covenant is. All right. Tell you what you do. <laughs> Go to Matthew chapter 1. Quick, Matthew chapter 1. You know, if you don't know... I mean, if you don't know, that's bad. But when you don't know that you don't know, that's worse. <laughs> no, I mean, that's really bad. You know, when you don't even know, you don't know. You think you know and you don't know. The Word of God says, I am everything God says I am. I have everything God says I have. I can do everything God says I can do. And I am where God says I am. Now, I have to confess that but I can't confess it if I don't know it. And that's what causes it to come to pass. I don't know how. I don't really care. What I do care about is that it works. Amen. I mean, how do you, you how many have cell phones? Probably most of you, you don't have a clue as to how they work. 
They really don't care. All you want to do is dial a number or download the Internet or, you know, whatever it is you want to do with it. But you don't have to know. All you got to do is what to do to get what you want from it. Isn't that right? I mean, there's a satellite up to 22,500 miles up in the sky. You can't even see the thing. It's beaming a footprint down on Earth. If you're in that zone where the footprint is, you can dial it up, take pictures, or whatever you want to do. All you got to do is just follow the directions when you get your telephone or your pager or your whatever. Well, you have a covenant. Did you find Matthew chapter 1? Okay. When you have Matthew chapter 1, first page, flip back one page. And you should find almost a blank piece or sheet of paper that says the New Testament. No, anybody have that? No, I'm going somewhere. This, you're going to learn something. Now, mine says the New Testament. Then it says words of Christ in red, something like that. Okay. Now, they said the New Testament, and then it starts with Matthew. Well, Matthew is not New Testament. Mark is not New Testament. Luke is not New Testament. John is not New Testament. Lord, where did pastor get this heretic? <laughs> well, watch it now. I'm, I'm sure we, might, we may have a lawyer here or a paralegal or somebody, and you just jump up and say, you're wrong, Dr. Price, when I get ready to explain what I'm getting ready to explain. If it's not legally correct, you tell me that I'm wrong. I don't have a problem with it. I change in a minute, just like that. But testament means will. And a will is a legal document when drafted by the person who wants to leave the will, who is technically and legally called the testator. Once he dies, only then can the will be executed in a court of law. As long as the testator is alive, the will cannot be legally defended in a court of law. It has no power until after the testator is dead. Anybody here know that for a fact? Not think it, okay? Okay, how can Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John be New Testament when all the way through it, Jesus is alive? He doesn't die till the end of each one of those four Gospels. Therefore, the new covenant or testament or contract or agreement cannot come into legal force until after his death. He doesn't die until the end of all of those. Excuse me. So, the new covenant is not the book of Acts. The book of Acts is historical. It's a history or history of the establishing of the church. The new covenant is Romans through the book of Jude. Everything from Romans to Jude tells you who you are, where you are, what you have, and what you can do by virtue of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Book of Revelation is not New Testament. It's a book about the end of everything called eschatology. It's an eschatological book. It deals with the end of everything. It doesn't promise you anything. It tells you what's going to happen in the end, but it's not a book that promises you as a child of God things per se. But Romans through Jude, and guess what? It covers any and everything you could ever need and anything you could ever desire that is consistent with a godly life. Notice how I qualified it. So that's what we're looking at, what we possess, what we have. Now, Satan, again, I told you he's a thief, a murderer, and he doesn't want us to get into this because when we get into this, he can no longer then lord it over us. Most Christians struggle through their whole lives. I know I did for the first 17 years until I found out about the word and about the covenant and about who I was, what I had, where I was, and what I could do. I struggled, and I thought it was normal. I thought that was the Christian life because after all, Brother Price, we're going to get it over there on the other side when we pass through the pearly gates and talk to Peter, James, and John about how we got over. <laughs> After a while, by and by. No, no, no. That's not Bible. That is tradition. That is theology. That is denominationalism. But it's not B-I-B-L-E. Amen. Amen. 
Now, let's look at some scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I don't know if you're ready for this. But I'm going to lay it on you anyway. And you can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> but you're going to have to confess that you, you, your, I said this the other night, I'll say it again, your faith will never rise above the level of your confession. Repeat after me. My faith, my faith will never rise, never rise above, the above the level of my confession. Of my, confession. My, faith my faith will never rise, never rise above the level above the of my confession. So we control where our faith functions or operates by virtue of our confession. If we confess doubt, unbelief, and fear, that's where your faith's going to operate. You'll have a lot of faith for losing. You'll have a lot of faith for being poor. On the other hand, turn it around and start saying what God says, and you will be absolutely amazed that God's word will produce exactly what it said. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you have it, say, I have it. All right. Verse 21. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Look at me, look at me. All things, T-H-I-N-G-S's. Not all spirituals, all things. Say things. 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 I didn't hear you. Things. I didn't hear you. Things. things. Okay, watch it. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God. Man, I can go home now. That's it. That, it's it. That's it. And that covers the whole thing. What else is left? Look at it. That's your word. That's your covenant. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul, we have Paul, we're reading Paul right now. Or Apollos, we don't know of any writings that he has. Or Cephas, uh, Peter, or the world, my God, or the world, or life, or death. Well, didn't we just read it in Proverbs 18, 21? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Here it is again, it validates it. In the mouth of two or three witness, witnesses, let every word be established. Here it is, look, look, look. <laughs> Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God. That's your Father talking to you. And you are on welfare and or have a welfare mentality. Now, don't want to play the fool and go down there and tell them folks to take you off the welfare roll until you learn how to walk by faith and develop your faith and get to the point where you can make balance with that and then you can get off. But don't go down there because you're going to starve. <laughs> Amen. And don't come asking me for nothing because I'm not going to give you nothing. I'm not going to give you a dime. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, nobody gave me anything. And you'll never really appreciate it until you use your own faith and take God at his word and find out that his word is true for you. Amen. Not for Fred Price, for you. Amen. And then nobody can talk you out of it. I don't care what they say. You will know that you know that you know that you know for yourself. And that's when you become exceedingly dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. Because Satan knows he can't bluff you out anymore. Because you know, I have the word. Whenever he comes in like a flood, I say, can you read? Can you read, devil? If you can't read, I'll read it to you. Look, look, look right here, devil. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are mine. So you have to learn how to make this personal. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are mine. And I am Christ and Christ is God. See, if this, is, this is to you. So you've got to make it personal. See, it's mine. All things are mine. I'm supposed to prosper. I'm supposed to be in good health. I'm supposed to eat the best, wear the best, live in the best. I don't know why people get so upset about 
us that talk about things like this. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? Have you ever scoped out where God lives? <laughs> he lives in a city that has streets that are made out of gold. Not people say paved with, no, 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 paving is something you put over the top of something. They're made from the roadbed to the top where the chariot wheels run is gold. Question, how many streets in Arlington are made out of gold? Huh? Excuse me? I didn't hear that. What? What? So if God, the creator, lives in a city that has streets made out of gold, what's wrong with us having streets made out of gold? You know if that's what you want. Six thousand miles of gold. So God's not opposed to it, but we've let the devil trick us and let all the sinners get all the gold. And the church struggles financially because we think we're not supposed to have anything. That's exactly what the devil wants you to think. Here it is right here. Watch this now. I want to ask you a question. It says, therefore, let no one boast, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world, or life or death or things present. Things. Is gold, is gold a thing? Yes. Is money a thing? Yes. Is platinum a thing? Yes. Huh? Yes. What? Yes. Talk to me. Yes. Well, he said all things are mine. So I have a right to the gold, to the platinum, to the silver, to the oil, to whatever. And the big issue of this whole thing, and this is the thing that just really gets me, is that Christians are so ignorant of this. They think it's all about the things. But it's not about the things for the sake of things. It's about the things to make a witness to the world. Don't you think, watch this, don't you think God, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. So if God so loved the world, that, that means he loves everybody in the world. Would you agree with that? Okay. W wouldn't that mean then that God loves the folk that ride in first class? Well, if you're riding in economy, how are you going to witness to the people in first class? <laughs> well, I never thought of that. Somebody got a witness to him, and you riding in coach, you're going to tell him about how God supplies all your needs, and you riding in coach? Praise <laughs> the Lord. Tell me to God. Somebody got to talk to those folk. You got to be on their level. They're not even going to listen to you. They're not going to give you a hearing. Amen. Amen. Folks got all upset when I first got my Rolls Royce. I had a Rolls Royce in 1985. I drove it for 18 years. The only reason I got the Rolls Royce, it cost a lot of money. The only reason I got the Rolls Royce is because at that time they were downsizing cars and changing stuff every year. I just got tired of the change. I wanted something to stay the same. And the model Rolls Royce that I got, Silver Spur, it lasted for about 12 years. Never changed the design or nothing. And then on top of that, whenever I would drive that car through the ghetto, <laughs> watch it. While brothers and sisters were ripping one another off, trying to get a few dollars from selling drugs and other stuff like that, you see that car went, where did you get it? What kind of drugs do you sell? I sell Jesus drugs. Let them know you don't have to kill one another. You don't have to steal. You don't have to victimize anybody. You can walk in righteousness and holiness, and you can drive a Rolls Royce. <laughs> all right. So all things are yours. All right, go to Psalm 115. 115 Psalm. What we have, what we possess. But I've got to say it. And I know people, they don't understand it, but that's their problem, not mine. It becomes my problem when I refuse to say it. When I go along with what the crowd does, I've got to go along with what the Word says so I can get in position where I can be a channel. 
People don't even understand. They don't even understand about prosperity. They, they, they think it's some kind of trick or some kind of gimmick or game. But jot this down. You may know the scripture, but jot it down. Don't look it up. You don't have time. Uh, Proverbs 8, uh, Proverbs 8.18. Was that 8.18? 8, 8, yeah, pro no, not Proverbs. Deuteronomy 8.18. Don't look it up. I think that's right. Deuteronomy 8.18, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Deuteronomy 8.18, and most people don't read it right. It says, remember, talking to the children of Israel just before they went into the promised land, he said, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. It's not the Lord who gives you wealth. It's the Lord who gives you power to get it. Power meaning ability to get the wealth. Oh, but then they stop right there and they don't read the rest of it. He said, remember, it's the Lord who gives you power to get wealth so that he, not so that we, so that he may establish his covenant, not that you may establish your private agenda. We're workers together with God. We're here in the field. He's at headquarters. We work for him. So he gives us power to get wealth so that he can establish his covenant. So if we don't have the wealth, he can't establish his covenant. Apparently, it must cost money to establish the covenant. Or there would be no reason for him to give us power to get wealth. So when you say, well, I, I don't need all of that. I don't need that much. I'm just a comfortable home. Uh, a, a nice automobile to drive, one or two changes of clothes. See, you are a selfish, I don't know what to call you. You're a very selfish person. All you're doing is thinking about yourself. You have just enough to take care of you and yours. But what about being a channel to be able to minister to other people? You have to have surplus. You have to have overflow. Boy, why am I not? That's not a part of this lesson. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Did I, tell you, did I tell you Psalm 115? Okay. Psalm 115. Now, verse 16. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Given it to us. We just read that in Corinthians. Life or death, all those things. He said, the world is ours in the context of his plan and purpose for the ages. All right, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Aye, aye. What we possess, these are the things we have. We have the world. I couldn't give anything until I got something. And the system is not designed for you to get anything. The system... The world system is presided over economically by Satan. God's not running the world system. Sorry to burst your bubble. Jesus called him the prince of this world. Paul called him the god of this world, or god of this age, meaning the world system, not the planet, not terra firma, but the system. That's why it's so unequal. That's why it's so messed up. Surely you don't think God's running this thing. If he is, he lost control a long time ago. And he says, let everything be done decent and in order. This thing is out of order. Huh? It's, it's what did I say? It's out of what? <laughs> it's out of order. And so if we don't learn how to take advantage of the word of God and utilize it, I mean, how long does it take to cover the earth? Particularly today, we could cover the earth, I mean, almost overnight with the technology that they have. Satellites, tell all these kinds of things. 2,000 years and we haven't covered the earth yet. There's still people that have never even heard of the name Jesus. But you know, how, you know what it takes to reach them? Money. Mega bucks. And who's going to finance it? Should be the Christian, but how can they, when they got their nose strapped to the grindstone and they just are barely making it for themselves with no surplus in order to give to be a channel to support ministries how's it going to get done and the system is not designed for you to get ahead it's designed to trick you into thinking you're making progress 
we have four children. We, we're a very close family. And uh, on holidays, we get together like Christmas and New Year's, not yeah, New Year's and sometime New Year's and, uh, and uh, Thanksgiving, we talk. And we get to talking about things. And every once in a while, my wife and I will talk about how we got started when we first got married. And um, like I said, we've been, we'll be married 56 years this month. And when we first got married, we could buy gasoline for 16 cents a gallon. Now think about what you make now on your job if all you had to pay was 16 cents for gas. Think about that. We could buy groceries for $10 and eat well. If we spent $12, we had gone berserk in the market. <laughs> but think of, they're not going to let you do that. Think about if you only had to pay 16 cents for your gas and $10 a week for groceries, it wouldn't take you long with what you make now. A couple of years, you'd be a millionaire. They're not going to let that happen. They let you go so far, make you think you're making progress, then they jack up everything. People making now more money than they ever even thought about making and doing less with it. Because the system is not designed for you to get ahead. It's designed for a few fat cats to get ahead. But the rest of us drive the machine. And they reap the benefits of it. So they're going to let you only make so much for so long, then they're going to jack up the prices. And you think you're making a lot of money, you may make enough. It still costs you more money now than it did before. So you got to learn. Watch this now. Listen carefully. you got to learn. <laughs> you got to learn how to operate outside the system legally. And you can only do it with the covenant. There's a way to do it. There's a way to do it. Now, you, uh, you're going you're to build another building. Is it, are, are you at liberty to talk about how much it may cost? Ten or twelve million dollars. Okay, the money should come from the congregation, right? You know, ultimately. Okay, um, I'm not gonna go there. No, I'm not. I'm just. No, I'm not gonna go there. No, no, no. I, I, I can't go. Uh, did I tell you to turn to Ephesians? I, I just ch checked myself. I better not go there. Ephesians chapter one. If you have it, say I have it. All right. Verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Stop right there. Stop right there. It doesn't matter what comes after who has blessed us. I'm reading from the New King James. The tradition says hath, but it means H-A-S, has. Past tense, time of action, already taken place. Done deal. We agree. Okay? Who has blessed us. So whatever comes after that, it really doesn't matter at this point. The point is I'm already blessed because he has. Not he is blessing, he has. It's done. But I'm going to have to tap into that. Now watch this. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Yes, Brother Price, but that's, that's wonderful. That's really great that the Lord has blessed me with, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. But, Brother Price, all four of my tires are bald. I, 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 I need tires on my car. That's, that's not spiritual, Brother Price. And, 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 you know, some storms may be coming up to some tornadoes or things, and the roof on our house is already in a precarious position. And, and they told me, the people told me to re-roof the house was going to cost a lot of money. And, and re-roofing the house is not spiritual, Brother Price. So it's wonderful that God has blessed me with spiritual blessing in heavenly places. But how about here in Arlington? Well, whether you know it or not, <laughs> every material thing was first of all spiritual. Think about it. What does the Bible say? Jesus said it, talking to the woman at the well, Jacob's well in Samaria. In the fourth chapter of John, he said, God is a spirit. God is a spirit. And then in Genesis it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So a spirit created the material universe, as far as we know, based on biblical records. So God, who is a spirit, created the physical three-dimensional world. So therefore, spiritual things must be more real than physical things because it took a spirit to create the physical 
And the spirit doesn't need the physical to be the spiritual, but the physical needs the spirit to be the physical. Did you get that? It says that God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth, as far as we know, are material, right? But a spirit created them. So everything physical was, first of all, spiritual in the mind of God, and he spoke it into existence when he said, let there be. So your roof is already in the spirit world. Your new car is in the spirit world. Your new clothes are in the spirit world. Your four new tires are in the spirit world. You can, through your faith and through the principles of the word of God, you can speak those things into existence, along with doing all the other things you're supposed to do in life. Don't misunderstand me. But they're already there. He's already blessed us. All I got to do is claim my blessings. People say, when they greet one another or leave one another, they say, well, the Lord bless you. That's in, you shouldn't say that as a Christian. You're already blessed. You, you might want to say something like, enjoy your blessings. <laughs> well, you just read it. Can you read? Or maybe the word has doesn't mean the same thing in Arlington as it does in Los Angeles. <laughs> in L.A., has me it done. Not being done. Not going to be done. Done. Right? He has blessed it. So I've got to begin to say, Father, thank you for my blessings. Thank you for that that you have made available to me. I claim it in the name of Jesus. Then I do all the other things in life based on the word of God and all the things that I need to do to cause those things to come to pass. And primarily, really, the biggest issue is just <laughs> sowing. Sowing. That's, the, that's really, the, you know, sowing, giving, tithes, offerings. Because most everything you need, all it takes to get it done is money. Right? Most all the things that you really need, particularly anything that's material, all you have to do is have enough money. You can buy anything you want with money. If they don't have it and they don't make it, they'll, you can commission it to be made. I've done it. That makes something personal for me. Got to pay for it. It costs a little more than the regular stuff. But if you've got enough money, they'll, they'll make anything you want. You can, if you can dream it, they can make it. All it takes is money. So money is the common denominator for all the basic things that we need and or want or desire. All about money. And there's no shortage of money. It's just not in the right hands. Of all the bad news that comes on at 6 o'clock in the evening, all the newscasts you're talking about, all, especially all this thing of bailouts and all that kind of stuff, in the context of all the stuff they're talking about, how bad things are economically around the world, you have not heard one commentator say, oh, we don't know what we're going to do. We're running out of money. <laughs> There's no more money. Fossil fuels are going fast. You've never heard anybody say, hey, ain't no more money. Plenty of money, just in the wrong hands. But if you learn how to operate outside the system where Satan dominates and controls and get in line with the word of God and begin to confess, give, sow your seed, make your confession over it for the harvest to come back to you and get that cycle going. It's super califragilistic, <laughs> expialidocious. <laughs> now, We have an enemy. Jesus said it in John 10, 10. He said, the thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Until you confess or say in faith that all those things that we've already talked about that the word clearly states belong to you are actually yours now, then the enemy will continue to keep you in spiritual, physical, and temporal bondage by robbing you of your inheritance and usurping your rights and authority. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm just about out of time, but I want to I show you this. 1 Peter chapter 5. This is one of the first things I learned when I really got a hold of the word that, that really set me free in life. And it's a part of what we have part of our inheritance. It's what we have. It belongs to me. I have a right to it. 
so many things, but I, time doesn't permit. First Peter chapter 5, you have it? Say, I have it. Okay, verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Situations in life come upon us, and you have things you're concerned with, things that you care about. A lot of you have things you worry about. Well, you shouldn't have any worry. You shouldn't worry about anything. I used to worry. I was a world champion worrier. I'm serious. I really worry. I worry back in those days, back when we first, started, first got married. I worried so much, I worried, worried a hole in my stomach called a peptic ulcer. And at that time, the only thing they had for it was baby food. You eat baby food or half and half, something like that. They didn't have all the medications they have now. I, used to, I just worried. And it got so bad, I worried about worrying. It was pitiful. I'm telling you, it was, my wife can tell you, it was pitiful. And I worried and worried and worried, and I didn't know what to do about it. And when I got a hold of the word, I found out what to do. And so I don't worry about anything. I don't worry about anything. I haven't worried about anything for years. I don't worry. Because I, he told me, this is what belongs to me. I, see, we're not made to carry worry. You're not constructed to carry it. It's an abnormality, and it'll take you to an early grave and cause a whole lot of other things. And there's no need to worry when you're in the hands of the Lord, but it, if you don't know that and you don't know how to confess it and turn all that over to, to the Lord, you'll, you'll never make it. And so I learned how to cast all my care upon the Lord. I cast my wife on the Lord. I cast my children. I cast my ministry. I remember when we were building the Faith Dome, those people were giving us all kind of, you know what, trying to get that thing built. And every morning, because it was, it was a big project, and uh, every morning I would wake up and the devil would be sitting at the foot of the bed. And, and he would say to me, he would say, suppose you don't get it built. What are the people going to think? And I said to the devil, I said, they'll probably think I didn't get it built. <laughs> so, so he couldn't get me with it. I told him, and you have to face him. I said, I don't care if it doesn't get built because I don't need it. What am I going to do, put my king-size bed on the platform in the middle of a 10,000-seat auditorium every night? I don't think so. The church belongs to the Lord. He directed me to build it. If he can't get it built, he doesn't need it because I sure don't need it. What am I going to do with it? See, so you've got you to face him. Otherwise, he'll intimidate you. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I don't care if it doesn't get built. Well, what are people going to think? I don't care. They're already thinking stuff. Let them think what they want to think. That's their problem, not mine. What I think about me and what's going on, that's what's important. And, and I was in, I want to leave this with you. I know I'm, going to run, I'm running out a little bit of time. Can I take a couple of minutes more? Just a, just a couple of minutes more? Okay, okay, because I want to show you this. Because a lot of people, a lot of Christians, they have this worry thing. You know, they worry about everything. Worry about their husband, worry about their children, worry about their wife. Just all kinds of business, all this kind of stuff. I mean, they, and they're in a knot. Times are bad, the news is bad. And so they worry a lot. I used to be like that. But it's the greatest thing in the world to be completely free. And see, if, if you're not careful, you, kind of, you might think, well, you don't care about stuff. It's not, I, I do care. That's why I don't worry. Because I really care, and I know God can handle it better than I can. Because what am I going to change by worrying? Nothing but me for the worse. And so I was in a meeting similar to this. It was in a conference, and I was a speaker, and I, I, I got a hold of the word, and I understood it from the standpoint of the word, but at that point in time, I was a baby in it, and I didn't have the practical, on hands experience of it, but I saw it in the world, word, and I was convinced this was it, I'm doing this. And I taught this lesson, and I just gave it everything I had, and at the end of the, the, the session, I gave an opportunity for questions. And uh, so this little lady stood up to about five foot four. She said, Pastor, I understand what you've been saying. I, I, I can see it in the word, and I understand it, but you know, you said not, not to worry, to cast it all on the Lord and all that. And, and, and all of that is fine. She said, but I want to ask you, how do I cast my husband on the Lord? He's six foot five, weighs 250 pounds. Now, how am I going to cast him on the Lord? And so right away in my spirit, I said to the Holy Spirit, all right, you got me into this. You got to get me out of this. And I would tell this lady. Because it's brand new. I saw the principle, but I didn't have the experience. And so the Lord told me, the Spirit of God told me what to do. Anybody have a piece of blank paper you can let me have? No, don't tear that. That's too nice. Anybody got any other? This is a better kind of. I don't want to mess up that nice book. Okay, thank you. 
Here's what the Spirit of God told me, and this can help you if, if you have a, a propensity towards worry or if you know someone who worries that's a Christian, you might want to share this with them. It'll help them set them free. You'd be surprised what a freedom it'll be in your life. Not to worry about anything. Your children, family, nothing. Yeah, you have your concerns, you, you know, you as a parent or guardian or whatever, but worrying where you, you, you don't sleep at night, can't keep any food down, body all messed up inside because of the turmoil of worrying. And so the Lord told me, this is what you tell this lady to do. I said, okay, sister, this is what you do. And, and be, people came from all over for this conference, so I didn't know whether she was in a hotel or home or what. I said, okay, whenever you get back home today, uh, after this session, either the hotel or whatever, get a piece of blank paper, sit down at the desk or wherever, and uh, put at the top my worries and my cares, underline it, and then number from one to a thousand. No, I'm joking. <laughs> number, you know, husband, wife, dog, hog, frog, job, career, school, children, wife, whatever, whatever represents your worry, the thing that you're concerned with that's got you climbing the walls and can't sleep at night. Write them all down on that piece of paper. And then when you get finished, get up from your desk, walk over to the waste paper basket and say to the Lord, Lord, you said cast all my care on you. I can't see you, so I don't know where your hand is. I, I don't know which direction to go. But as an example of what you've told me to do, this waste paper basket is going to represent your hand. These are my cares my worries, my concerns. Who has them now? Who doesn't have them? So I must be what? Free. Let the Lord take care of it. Dump them on him. <laughs>